All right, guys, so let's get to it. We're now taught in chapter five in the course textbook, uh, which is democratic regimes, democratic regimes. And so let me share screen really quickly. If you guys actually uh, got a chance to see the PowerPoint, you're gonna realize that it covers a lot of material, right? Like there's a lot of subdivisions for it. But the truth is, we don't have to know all of it. So let's get straight to what we do have to know. First thing we want to understand is how do we define democracy? Okay, And the textbook defines democracy as political power that is either exercised directly or indirectly by the people. Demos comes from people, the common people. So demography is when you're uh, writing down information about the people. Graph, writing, demos, common people. Uh, gracia comes from power or to rule. So uh, when you're talking about democracy, you're talking about rule by the common people, rule of the people. And uh, again, the textbook defines democracy um, as uh, where political power is exercised either directly uh, or indirectly by the people. Now, there are certain... <clears throat> characteristics that will always be present in a democracy. Uh, number one, they're, all, they're always going to have public participation, meaning that the people are going to be involved in it. Number two, there will be political competition, meaning there are going to be different groups trying to compete for elected offices. And number three, liberty, meaning that there will be a limit on the power of the government as it pertains to how it can rule the people. Those are some character characteristics that will always be present within democracy. Having said that, there are many different uh, forms that democracy takes place. We, of course, are most used to how democracy looks because we're as, as it pertains to the United States. But the truth is that the British model for democracy is very different from the American and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, In this chapter, what we're really focusing on is what's called liberal democracies, which are, again, you can think of liberal from the same sense that we've used liberal in the previous past or in the past. Uh, liberal democracy is going to promote participation of citizens. There's going to be competition for elected offices. There's going to be liberty for the people, and it's going to emphasize individual freedoms and civil rights. These are what we would really consider true democracies. However, there are also some regimes who consider themselves democracies because they have elections, uh, but they're not true democracies. We think of uh, countries like Russia and Iran. And uh, the reason that we know that they're not true democracies is because um, either participation is not inclusive for everybody or competition is not as robust and strong as it should be, meaning that there's not a lot of options to be able to choose from. Or in some capacity, maybe the government has too much control over the people and to the extent that they're not truly free, they're not, there's not a lot of liberty. Uh, either one or more of those elements are compromised severely in a liberal democracy. So you can think of an illiberal democracy as almost like a fake democracy or, um, uh, you know, they, they scholars sometimes call them electoral democracies because all they do is have elections uh, but they're not free elections, they're not real elections. And we're going to talk about them a little bit more uh, in chapter six. But I just want to start throwing that concept out there for you. Okay. Um, we don't really need to know a lot, a lot about how democracy starts. You know, it starts in Greece, where people just would randomly vote every single time on all their laws. We call that direct democracy, uh, where people vote each time on uh, what rules should be in place for that society. However, we should know the concept of republicanism, right? Um, republicanism stresses this concept of indirect democracy. Indirect democracy is where the people choose representatives uh, to uh, represent them. To So we vote on representatives to pass laws. We don't make the laws directly, but we have representatives who represent us, right? And so republicanism is this concept of an indirect democracy that pushes the separation of powers, meaning we have separate branches of powers within a state, 
Um, and you are going to be represented by the public through elected officials. Of course, what is a separation of powers? Uh, this is a concept that's known as the clear division of power among different branches of government and the provision that specific branches may check the power of other branches. Okay. So a direct democracy, again, uh, the public is going to participate directly in the governance and policy making. Indirect democracy, the public is going to participate indirectly through its elected representatives. Uh, and today, almost every democracy that's that's a true democracy is going to be an indirect democracy. Okay. Uh, modern day democracy, you're going to look at the Magna Carta, which serves as the first real document in the English history to restrict the power of the king. It creates uh, courts and judicial rights. It uh, says that Parliament is going to have uh, the ability to tax and, and control borrowing. However, the Magna Carta's rights were going to be restricted uh, over time or going to be removed over time. There's only four clauses that are still relevant today. However, it remained an inspiration for the future of the democracy experiment in the United Kingdom and in the United States. The Magna Carta heavily influences the US Constitution, okay? Um, one of the things we have to discuss is why is it that we have uh, democracy today? And there are going to be five explanations that are going to be covered, not just in this chapter, but repeatedly throughout the rest of this course. And uh, <clears throat> those five uh, explanations for democracy are going to be the modernization theory, uh, the elites theory, the civil society theory, international relations theory, and political culture. So um, the modernization theory is very simple. As societies modernize economically, a middle class emerges, the population becomes more wealthy, better educated and urbanized. Urbanized simply means uh, they start living in cities. Uh, old concepts of authority and hierarchy with concepts like the king are going to get weakened and new, val new values like tolerance, like gender equality are going to emerge. Now, uh, evidence that supports this theory, many democracies are wealthy countries, right? So as you become wealthier as a country, the idea here is that you're gonna modernize and that modernization is going to automatically free up your country because of their new existing middle class, uh, because people are going to become richer, more educated. And as that happens, they're going to become more tolerant of one another and they're going to want democracy. However, uh, the counter to this theory uh, started happening in the 1970s simply because uh, so many countries started becoming more modern and more rich, and they did not become democratic. Uh, countries like China, for example. And by the same token, um, some countries uh, did become uh, democratic and didn't necessarily become uh, more modernized. So uh, this, this modernization and democratic theory uh, has kind of fallen a little bit out of favor recently. A second theory as to why democracy takes place is because of the elites theory. This concept is simple. Uh, when wealth and state power are held by the same people, elites are more resistant towards democracy if they fear losing their wealth. But if they believe that a transition to democracy will allow the rich to keep their wealth, like in South Africa, like in Chile, um, or if supporting democracy wins the elites international support, then the elites may push to remove non-democratic uh, aspects of their governance in support of democracies. Again, uh, if the elites feel that it's to their benefit to become democratic, they will. That's the basic concept of the elites and democratization um, theory. Now, of course, the problem with the theory is that sometimes if elites believe that the current system that is non-democratic benefits them better, then they will be against many times and more resistant to democracy because it hurts their crime, uh, their financial interests. Okay. Um, now, the third theory, society and democratization. Here you're going to be listening to this concept that the public is going to be in a better position to push for democracy if civil society is strong. And so now we have to define civil society. Civil society is defined as 
organized life outside of state control that helps people define and advance their own interests. So civil society is going to include things like church groups and uh, recreational sports league, like in sports leagues, like Koala Sports, or um, I don't know, uh, really like organized activity, organized groups are going to form part of civil society. Okay. And the idea here is that as you start having more and more of these groups forming, typically they're going to rule the groups themselves. The groups themselves are going to be governed through democracy and through the exchange of ideas. And as people become more accustomed to uh, being able to express their ideas and vote on which ideas are better within those organized groups, they're going to want the same concepts applied for how the state is governed or for how the uh, government is governed. And so when civil society has uh, emerged and strengthened, uh, the end result, some argue, has been democracy within that state. And they, uh, the textbook authors list as examples um, the 1989 revolts in Eastern Europe that led to the fall of communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union was organized by civil groups that became more and more civil society, that became more and more involved with with the day-to-day -day affairs of people okay um now uh frequently because of uh, the, the textbook mentions also examples of civil society of uh, bowling clubs um labor unions etc now because uh there is uh this idea that civil society can help create democracy, non-democratic leaders frequently try to limit civil society or try to control civil society so that their rule is not threatened. Uh, an example of this is China, which limits the activities of environmental or religious groups, even when they don't have anything to do with politics. A fourth theory for how it is that we became democratic or how countries become democratic is through international relations. The idea here is that uh, in democratic states can play a direct or indirect role in promoting democracy. Uh, states can export democracies, right? And so an example here is how the United States and allied powers upon occupying Japan and upon occupying Germany instilled democracy in Japan and in Germany. Um, and they also believe the arguments go that non-governmental organizations, uh, these are organizations that are not uh, controlled by the government, that uh, are international can also help promote democrat democracies within other countries by training people on how democracy works. Okay. Yeah. Now, in order for this theory to work, your country has to be somewhat involved with the world because, for example, North Korea, which has very limited contact with the outside world, is not going to be easily pressured by uh, pro democracy groups from the West. Again, North Korea doesn't have any relationships with the West, right? Um. <clears throat> Last but not least, uh, this idea that um, culture is what helps lead, uh, pave the way rather for democracy. The idea here is that Western style values like individualism and like secularism are going to be required for democracy to take place. So uh, you have to have certain values from a cultural standpoint in order to have democracy exist. That's what the theory suggests. And the evidence that supports this theory is how Democracy first comes about in Western Europe and North America, places where there was support for individualism, where there was support for secularism. Now, uh, the counter argument to this is that democracy can emerge out anywhere and that uh, local culture will shape it with its values and how they want to design and practice democracy within those states. Uh, and they'll also point out to how all of, everywhere in the world, regardless of which continent you're in, has at least one country with a democracy. Okay. Um, and so perhaps some of the more famous examples of non uh, of non-Western democracies, you're going to look at Japan and South Korea. Okay. Um, these are examples of countries that have democracies. And if you go to Oceania, you look at Australia and New Zealand. Uh, if you look at Africa, you look at South Africa. Uh, if you look at Latin America, you would look at countries like uh, Brazil, right? Um, if you look, you know, all of these countries have democracies and they're no longer influenced really by Western culture. 
And so this theory may also have its flaws. So the truth is that all five of these theories have their own flaws, but you have to be able to understand how they work uh, or what they mean. Remember the modernization theory is one theory, the elites theory, the other civil society, international relations and political culture. Modernization means that as your country develops, they're going to create a middle class. And as the middle class becomes wealthier, they're going to become more educated and they're going to want democracy as a result. The elites theory is that as elites uh, become more rich, if it stands for them to benefit from a move towards democratic values, because they're going to either become more rich or their rights are going to be better protected, they're going to want to support democracy. The third theory is civil society. Again, the idea that as organized life outside of the government becomes more structured and more prominent within a state, the likelihood that that state becomes democratic greatly increases. Fourth theory, international relations, this idea that other countries that are democratic can export these democratic values to countries that don't have experience with democracies. And last but not least, the political culture theory, which states that uh, if you are a supporter of Western values like individualism, like secularism, then you're going to ultimately support democracy. But you have to have those cultural values as a precondition to democracy. That's what that theory states. Okay. Now, uh, what are the institutions of every democracy? Well, you've known this, you've seen this in civics classes and government classes, right? You have your three main branches, the executive, the legislative, and the constitutional, and then the judicial. Um, what I need you to understand is how the executive is going to be divided into a head of state and head of government. Uh, and we have to explain what those concepts mean and how there are different ways for an executive to be divided depending on the democracy, depending on how the country is run. Okay. The legislative branch is always going to be kind of the same. There's always going to be, in the sense that they're always going to be involved in passing laws, but they can be unicameral or bicameral. We'll get to talking about that in a little bit. And then the judicial system with a constitutional court that has the power to decide whether uh, laws passed by that country or acts done by government officials contradict the constitution. If it does, they can stop the government behavior from taking place. They can stop the law from uh, remaining a law in that country. Okay. So let's get first to the executive. You have to know this concept for the rest of the course, because even though you've heard of what the executive branch does before, you have probably not focused a lot on how there are two main roles that the executive branch conducts throughout the world. Okay, so the executive branch, again, is the branch that's going to ex execute, that's going to carry out the laws, enforce the laws and policies of a state. That's the executive branch. Now, the leader of the executive, there's two different roles that an executive leader may have. The head of state is an executive role that symbolizes and represents the people, both within that country and uh, outside of that country internationally. On the other hand, the head of government is the person within the government that is involved in the day-to-day -day aspect of running the state. Uh, in other words, they're going to be the ones that are going to execute the policy, the domestic policy of that state. And so these are two different roles, okay? <clears throat> Some countries combine the role between of, of head of state and head of government, and that's our experience in the United States. In the United States, we have what's called the presidential system. And if you're in a presidential system, what that simply means is that you're going to have a president who's going to be both the head of state and the head of government. And so both executive roles are going to be merged in one office, in the office of the president. However, uh, many other countries, in fact, most other countries in the world, divide the role of the head of state and the head of government. Uh, one of the more example, one of the better examples that we need to be aware of is the United Kingdom, where there is a now a king, right? Long live the king. And the king serves as the head of state in the United Kingdom, whereas uh, the prime minister serves as the head of state. Okay. So um, in a parliamentary system, which is what uh, the British have, uh, there will probably be, um, uh, you know, a, a divided role between a president and a prime minister. We're going to talk about this more later on. 
the legislature. The legislature is the branch of government that's going to be responsible for making laws. And there's going to be two different kinds of legislatures, the bicameral systems and the unicameral systems. Bicameral systems, you're going to have two houses that are going to be responsible for passing laws. Uh, it is going to be the bicameral systems are going to be common in larger, more diverse countries. Uh, and it's also going to be frequently uh, related to federalism because in one of the houses, many times you're going to see that states' rights are going to be better protected within that uh, larger, within that house, frequently the upper house, right? And if you have a bicameral system, there may be different ways and different rules to elect public officials. So you may have one rule set of rules to elect members of the lower house, and you may have a different set of rules to elect members of the upper house. Now, the other the other way that the that a that a legislature can be divided is into a unicameral system, and in this instance, you only have one house for the legislature. Uh, the nice step here is that you don't have to worry about a president uh, vetoing the legislation because um, I'm sorry, you don't have to worry about the upper house and the lower house fighting over the legislation because if you're in a unicameral system, uh, all it takes is uh, one. Brand the, the 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 one lawmaking house to pass the law in order for that to become law, a law problem. Okay. Um. <clears throat> now, uh, unicameral systems are frequently going to be found in unitary governments, meaning that there isn't federalism, so there's not a division of shared power between the federal, national government, and the state governments or the regional governments, right? And if there is federalism, you're going to more likely to not find a bicameral system, okay? But that's not exactly always true. For example, the United Kingdom is a uh, unicameral system, meaning that there's only, uh, I'm sorry, it's, it's a, uh, the United Kingdom, I apologize, is a bicameral system. There's two houses, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, uh, the House of Commons is the lower house. The House of Lords is the upper house. And yet, despite having a bicameral system, the United Kingdom is a unitary state. So it's not always true that a bicameral system automatically leads to a federalist state or that a unicameral system automatically leads to a unitary state. Okay. Um, now... Uh, how these lawmakers get selected is also interesting. In the United States, uh, all of the members of the House and the Senate are going to be elected directly by the public. Uh, in the United Kingdom, the upper house is going to be made by an appointment. So it's an appointed position. And it's going to look a little bit differently than uh, what you've become accustomed to seeing in the United States. That's only for the upper house of the United Kingdom's parliament. The House of Commons, which is the lower house, is going to be a direct uh, election by members. Last but not least, a democracy will frequently have a judicial branch where the government is going to uphold and maintain what's known as the rule of law. You have to understand the meaning of what a rule of law means. I've seen this pop up in FRQs. Rule of law is a system in which all individuals and groups, including those in government, are subject to the law, regardless of their power or authority. And so a key component of judicial of, of, of the judiciary are going, going to be courts, which are institutions that are going to interpret um, how laws are applied within a country, okay? Uh, additionally, uh, courts are also going to follow a hierarchy, meaning that the losers in the case are usually going to be able to appeal to a higher court. And the highest court of the judiciary is usually going to be in a democracy, the constitutional courts, because 90% of democracies have a constitutional court. A constitutional court, a court is simply meaning simply is simply means the highest judicial body in a political system that decides whether laws and pol policies violate the constitution. Okay, all constitutional courts are going to have the power of judicial review which is uh, the means through which courts can review government actions and overturn those that violate the Constitution. Additionally, some constitutional courts, like the United States, are also going to have the, the highest appellate courts. Not every single country follows that logic. Okay, 
It's important to know that the United Kingdom, for the longest time, despite being the oldest democracy in the world, did not have a constitutional court. Not until 2009. Okay? And so even if they, even though they have a constitutional court, it's very weak and it was only created by parliament, which in theory means that parliament could, could also uh, result, in theory, parliament could also dissolve the judicial courts. Okay. Um, and so I think that's where I'm going to stop today. Uh, I'm going to stop in slide 29. You guys are going to be responsible for those first 29 slides. Until next time. Bye, guys.